We want to talk about quotas and other quantitative restrictions in a market. How do quantitative restrictions, restrictions on the amounts that can be bought or sold, affect a market? Let us look first at restrictions on supply. Let us say that some kind of supply restriction is put in place at a quantity that is less than would have been bought and sold in a free market. That quantity is represented by the vertical line labeled QR. We need to construct what would be the effective supply curve under these circumstances. If the price happened to be low enough that the amount of supply would be less than the quantitative restriction anyway, then the supply curve is relevant. Any price that would have resulted in a quantity smaller than the QR, we are on the supply curve. But if we are at a price in this market, any price that would have called forth a supply greater than a quantitative restriction, then the quantitative restriction binds and we end up with only that amount being supplied. So the effective supply curve in the market is the supply curve for quantities less than the QR and then the QR thereafter. That is the effective supply curve in the market. Once we have constructed that, then we analyze the market as we did before. The market clears where the demand and the effective supply curves cross. And that determines the price, which is going to be a higher price than would have obtained at the free market equilibrium. So a quantitative restriction, unsurprisingly, results in a higher market price. And it divides the market into the suppliers who are able to get the authority or the permission get to remain in the market and supply the quantity allowed and those that are kicked out of the market. Some are better off, some are worse off. An interesting example of a quantitative restriction is London's Green Belt. Many countries have and cities have zoning restrictions that say what kind of development can take place in, in, in which areas. In the UK, there is an area, a large area surrounding the city of London, which is zoned for no development. It remains a green zone. This green belt encircles London and strict planning regulations keep it open and undeveloped. It is no surprise, therefore, what effect this has on rents in the city of London. Most cities are able to, to, to demonstrate sprawl that, that as the city grows, as more people move into the city and the population expands, the city spreads out laterally. Well, London is not able to do that because of the green belt. And the model tells us that what happens is that prices in the market rise above where they otherwise would be. So rents in London tend to be higher than in nearly every other city in the world on average. Another beautiful example of a quantitative restriction on supply is taxes in Manhattan in New York. The amount of taxi licenses called medallions 
was determined and fixed at roughly 13,500 in 1937. And for the most part, the number of taxi medallions has not increased since then. And the demand for taxis in Manhattan has increased considerably, both because the population has grown and because the ability of the population and the willingness of the population to pay incomes have grown even more. As a result of which, taxis in Manhattan are quite expensive and the market for the licenses themselves had exploded. At its peak, if you wanted to buy a license to operate a taxi in Manhattan, in 2013, it reached $1.3 million to buy a license. If you wanted to get into the taxi business in Manhattan, you had to be already a millionaire before you began. The price of the medallions have come down since then because of competition from ride sharing services. Here's another example of a kind of a quantitative restriction. Lawyers in the US keep their numbers carefully pruned, pushing up costs. Barriers to entry have kept the number of lawyers artificially low for decades. This results in an unearned premium on legal wages. These barriers take various forms. Uh, the American Bar Association accredits law schools, and in most states, you must be a graduate of one of them to practice law. The second hurdle for a would be lawyer is the bar exam. And finally, American states do not allow non-lawyers to manage or invest in law firms. Nor can companies not run by lawyers practice law in any form. Now, many of these restrictions exist in other countries as well, but in combination, they are greater in the United States than in even other developed countries. And the result is, that the average American law firm lawyer earns $191,000 a year. The average salary that corresponds to that in Canada was just $64,000. So in our model, this looks like the quantitative restriction being more severe in the United States resulting in $191,000 as the price of a lawyer in the United States compared to $64,000 in a country where that quantitative restriction does not apply. Let us now turn to see what a quantitative restriction looks like on the demand side. For it to be binding, it has to be less than the quantity at which the market would clear. And as we did for the supply side, the actual demand curve becomes irrelevant for any quantity greater than a quantitative restriction. The demand curve is only relevant for quantities less than a quantitative restriction. So that represents, that green line represents the effective demand curve in this market. And the market clears where the effective demand curve and supply curves intersect. And that is going to be at a price which is less than what would have obtained in the absence of the quantitative restriction. It creates a division in the market 
between the consumers who are able to obtain this restricted uh, quantity, who are now getting it at a lower price, and consumers who are shut out of the market and not able to get it even at the price that they are willing to pay. Even though the price they are willing to pay is above what obtains in the market. What we see in the case of uh, quantitative restriction on the demand side is that there needs to be some, some mechanism to restrict quantity, to restrict the demand. In the same way that we explored the mechanisms for doing so in the case of supply, there are mechanisms on the demand side. And one of those mechanisms is to have quotas on the amount that each person can purchase. Each person can purchase only two or three. In, in countries with, with a great deal of state interference in the economy, this is sometimes accomplished by the use of ration books and ration cards, that households are issued a ration ticket, which determines the quantity of a of a scarce commodity that can be purchased, limiting the amount that can be demanded. Interfering in the market by means of quantity restrictions creates some problems. As with all market interferences, it creates deadweight losses. Once a quantity being traded ends up being less than would obtain in a free market, there are deadweight losses. There are potentially welfare creating trades that do not get to take place. You, then you have enforcement costs. If you are going to restrict quantity supplied or restrict quantity demanded, then there has to be an administrative mechanism and policing to make sure that the system of restrictions is, is carried out. And so that adds to the deadweight losses because resources are then used up administering the system instead of producing goods and services of direct utility to the economy. Since quantitative restrictions divide the market into those who get to stay in the market and get to sell it or get to buy it, and those who are left out of the market, then there has to be some way of determining that. In a free market, price determines who gets to be in and who gets to be out. Price is the rationing mechanism. That's the purpose of price. With a quantitative restriction, where some get to buy and some don't, it depends on who gets the quota and who gets the license, and it opens up the opportunity for favoritism and corruption to make that determination. And finally, what we end up with is a misallocation of resources in the economy because the economy does not get to devote an amount of resources sufficient to what consumers actually want. And therefore resources are going to end up being deployed to, to less useful and less, uh, less satisfying uh, products, goods and services. Qualitative restrictions may be justified under many circumstances. But what we have learned is that that justification has to outweigh the detrimental effects that we have outlined. <laughs>
quantitative restrictions contract market and create dead weight losses.